which heaven's joys so bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of Hello. Welcome again to our study of the book of Genesis. You remember that in our last study together, we began to look at the book in terms of an introduction. We discovered where the name came from. In the beginning would be the Hebrew name, but for us it's Genesis, a word that ultimately appears in the book over and over again. These are the generations, or this is the history, would literally be the meaning of that particular title of this book. We found out that Moses is the author, and you may have already known that, but we established it by demonstrating that the Lord thought of Moses as the writer. We furthermore saw the reliability of this book. It's not a book filled with myths, as some would say, but instead the Lord and the apostles, other inspired penmen, all viewed this book as in reality being from God and reporting true stories that all of us need to learn about so that we can be directed in the path God wants us to follow. We discovered basically two purposes for the book. The first purpose that we observed was the purpose of showing us the beginnings of the universe, the beginnings of that group of people who would ultimately be the source of the coming of the Savior and how that God worked with them. But the second and greater purpose was to show us the relationship between God and man, how that it was lost and how that God sought to restore it, even beginning in this very first book of the Bible. Now today, we actually want to begin to open up the text Genesis chapter 1. As we do, I think we all could virtually quote together verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How interesting that the writer just assumes the existence of God. In the beginning, God. He uses that name so quickly and so easily because he believes in that God. He knows that God. Moses had an intimate relationship with the God of the Bible, and so he writes about him with ease. Observe that the name God is used repeatedly in this first chapter of the book of Genesis. The name that is used is Elohim. Now, it is plural, but that may be a bit deceptive. Long ago, in my own life, I thought that it was plural because God has more than one member, and of course He does. But that's not the reason this word is plural. The Hebrews used the plural to express the idea of authority or of power. This is the authoritative God, Elohim. And so that word is used in Genesis 1-1 and flowing all the way down through chapter 2, verse 3. Listen as we look at the number of times it is used here. In verse 1, in the beginning, God. In verse 2, the Spirit of God. Verse 3, then God said. Verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good, and God divided. Verse 5, God called the light day. Verse 6, then God said. Verse 7, thus God made. Verse 8, and God called the firmament. Verse 9, then God said. Verse 10, and God called. Verse 11, then God said. Verse 12, and God at the end of the verse. Verse 13 doesn't mention God, but by the time you get to 14, you find, then God said. In verse 16, then God made. 
In verse 17, God set. In verse 18, toward the end, and God saw. Verse 20, then God said. Verse 21, so God. And then at the end of the verse, and God. In verse 22, we begin with the words, and God blessed. In verse 24, then God said. In verse 25, and God is at the beginning, and then at the end, and God saw. Verse 26, then God said. Verse 27, so God created. He created man how? In the image of, guess what? God. Verse 28, then God blessed. Verse 29, and God said. Verse 31, then God. In fact, 32 times the name of God is used in this opening chapter of the book of Genesis. Clearly, the author has wanted us to begin with the understanding that God is a reality. He is, as it were, an underlying principle of everything that we will read in this book of Genesis. Awe and reverence belong to the God of the Bible. All that is brought on, as you think about it, because of the way in which He creates. God creates by just speaking. It comes into existence when He merely says the words. He doesn't have to act in the way that we would to form something with His hands. Oh, no. Instead, because of His awesome power, He is able merely to speak and things come into existence. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, it's for that reason that Moses writes, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, and shall take oaths in His name. You shall fear. It's an interesting word. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul lets us know that perfect love casts out fear, as he writes to the young man Timothy. And yet here Moses says we are to fear God, or at least the Hebrew brethren were. What does he have in mind here? Well, it's not the trembling fear that we might have if we saw a rattlesnake coiled up in front of us. Instead, this fear is an awesome respect, a reverence for God. That's what we all need to have, and that kind of fear we all need to have. It's much like we have, hopefully, for our earthly fathers. We don't tremble in front of them. We know they love us. But we do have an awesome respect for them. And even more so, we ought to have respect and awe for the great father of the Bible. As used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 then, the word God refers not merely to a worshipful being, but to the only one to be worshipped. There is no other God who is to be worshipped. And so, Jesus, when He talks about it with Satan, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10 says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. Hugo McCord notes that Jesus added the word only to that text. It's not found in the Hebrew text of Genesis chapter uh, of Exodus, but instead it is found in Jesus' words because it's understood that when he says, Him you shall serve, that it is only God that we should serve. Elohim is the plural word, as we've already noted. It is a word that is used over and over again to describe this powerful God. Notice that the creator of the universe is uh, pictured in Scripture as being one. Now that's intriguing. Because when you think about it, we know that there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. And yet, the God of creation is one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, 
Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, we find, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. The verb created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is an interesting word. In the Hebrew, it is the word bara. It's a singular word, and yet, as we've already observed, with a plural noun. It appears that among the ancients, a scription of authority was implied by the use of plural forms. The plural form of the word Lord is used to describe Joseph, for instance, in Genesis chapter 42, verse 30. Now, all of us know that Joseph was just one man, and yet the plural is used because he was the governor. No one was more powerful than Joseph in the land of Egypt other than Pharaoh himself. Other names for God are also plural in Scripture. For example, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, he's described as the Lord. The word that is used is plural. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verse 10, he is described as the Holy One, but that too is plural. In Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 1, the word for Creator is plural in form. And in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5, the word translated maker is also plural. All of these are plural, not because there are a multiplicity of gods. There's only one God. But that one God is authoritative. He is powerful. The word bara for created is an interesting word. And it is found in Genesis 1.1, and it literally means to make from nothing. That word is never used to talk about man. Only God can create from nothing. They tell the story, and of course it's a made-up story, of three scientists who believe they discovered the way to create life. And so they go to God and say, we know how to make life. And God says, all right. And they say, well, come with us and we will show you. And he says, fine. And they pick up three buckets of dirt and start for the door. And God says, no, no, no. Bring your own dirt. Well, you see, they don't know how to create life. Uh, they have to start, in other words, with something God's already made. And that would always be true of man. If we make something, we don't really create it in the sense of starting with nothing. Instead, we start with something and we manufacture it. That's not the word in Genesis 1.1. God created from nothing. There's nothing out there, but God from it, from nothing, formed the universe that we know and, of course, everything that we can see and that we can touch. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verse 17, we find the great messianic prophet saying, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. In Amos chapter 4, verse 13, we find, For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts, is His name. In both of these passages, the word translated create or created is that word which means to make from nothing because that's what God did in the very beginning. No materials were used to create the dust out of which both man and animals were formed. We'll discover that in Genesis chapter 2 as we see God forming the animals out of the dust of the earth, and he forms man out of the dust of the earth as well. McCord said, Creation out of nothing is implied in this word. In Psalm chapter 33, in verse 6, we find, but the word of the, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. 
The writer of Hebrews, you may remember, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the, thing, by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which appear. We could not have fully understood or have appreciated this as human beings because we've never done it. But God is God. And we are awed by His ability to create literally from nothing. Now, we need to stop long enough to realize that though it's not discussed in Genesis chapter 1, that God created not just the universe that we know, but He also created the angels. In the book of Psalms, chapter 148, verse 2, for example, the singer of Israel says, Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. And in verse 5, he goes on to say, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. You hear that? The angels were created by God. Their creation, apparently, was before the foundation of the world that we see described in Genesis chapter 1. Job chapter 38, verse 7. Job writes this about the angels. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. He there is describing the angels and how they celebrated in the midst of the creation. God made them. And they were there when He began His mighty work. Seven times in Genesis chapter 1, God <clears throat> is said to have seen the things that He created and to have observed that they were good. The seventh time, in fact, it says they were very good. God saw His work and He was pleased with it. What did He do in the creation? Well, of course, on day one, he created light and divided it from the darkness. On day two, He created the firmament. And that's a little bit difficult for us to understand. We'll look at it more later. But observe that the world, as it were, when first created, was a great round ball covered with water. God then separated the waters that were on the earth from the waters above the earth. And so we end up with, as it were, another ball. And there's a space between the water on the earth and the water above the earth, up in what we, uh, what we might call the sky. And so there is then created this space. It's called the firmament. When you read about it in Genesis chapter 1, you and I would call it heaven. Heaven in the sense of the place where the birds fly that we can observe every day. So God on the second day made this firmament, this space where the birds would fly. On day three, the dry land appeared. So this water on the earth was caused to again to separate out. So that there was land and then there was water. Uh, they could be seen. That dry land was covered on day three with vegetation. On day four, the sun, the moon, and the stars were all created. Interestingly enough, scientists who don't even believe in God or the Bible have suggested that light existed before the sun. Well, that's true enough. God created light on day one, but on day four, He created these uh, great items in the sky that would rule, as it were, over the light. Uh, in, on day five, God created the marine life and the winged fowl, if you would, the birds of the air. And then finally, on day six, God created the land animals and man. Seven days of creation are found in Genesis chapter one. But some people would say, well, wait a minute. Are those real, literal days? I mean, days the way that you and I would think about days. The answer, it seems to me, is very apparent just by reading the text. Let's look briefly, for example, at verse 5 of Genesis chapter 1. 
God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now think about it just a minute. How do we divide our day? Well, we generally divide it into day and night. The Hebrew people, though, divide it just the opposite. They divide it into night and day. But how long does it take the day to pass? We would say approximately 12 hours. How long does it take the night to pass? Well, approximately 12 hours. So how long then are the days of Genesis chapter 1? It is apparent just from this simple observation that any of us could make, even a child could make. We would readily say the days were 24 hours. And that is confirmed to us in Exodus chapter 20. When God is giving the Ten Commandments, as He gives those Ten Commandments, observe that He says God created in six days. The word that is used for days there, translated days, never has a definite number in front of it unless they are literal 24-hour periods. And so how long did it take God to make the universe? Well, He did it in six literal days. God is, after all, God. He is all-powerful. He is awesome. And we see His awesomeness, as it were, in this creation done in six days. Who is this Creator? Well, interestingly enough, this Creator is introduced to us in chapter 2. Now, something we need to understand about the Hebrew writers. When the Hebrews wrote something, <clears throat> they often would give a general overview and then give a more specific, detailed view, sometimes just of a particular aspect of the thing that had been overviewed before. That's exactly what we find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In Genesis 1, we have a great overview, as it were, of creation. An overview that demonstrates to us God made everything in six days. But by the time we get to Genesis chapter 2, particularly beginning at verse 4, we begin to see God specifically creating. Creating man, creating the animals and parading them before man so that He can name them. Creating woman. This is a much more detailed, specific, and if you would, narrow view of creation than we saw or see in chapter 1. In chapter 2, verse 4, all of a sudden, the writer Moses goes from simply saying, God, Elohim, to saying Yahweh, Elohim. Now, we really don't know how to say that word Yahweh. It's often just called the Tetragrammaton because it has four consonants. Y-H-W-H are the consonants most often used by the Hebrew people to describe this word. How do you say it? Well, we don't know because they wouldn't say it. God said, don't speak my name in vain. So they, in response to that, just didn't speak it at all. And the, thereby we lost how to pronounce this name. But we didn't lose what it means. They substituted the word Adonai for it. Because it carries the idea of Lord, as it were. This is Lord God, or God the Lord, if you would. It is a name that we will see over and over again in Scripture. Interestingly enough, the people of the book of Genesis never understood or knew God with this name. Instead, they called Him El Shaddai, Lord Almighty. Uh, but in place of that, uh, we first find the name Lord God defined for us, particularly Yahweh or Lord, when God speaks to Moses in the great burning bush incident in uh, Exodus chapter 3. It is there that God explains what His name means. I am 
that I am. <coughs> Excuse me. You and I would say it differently. We would say, I exist by my own power. I exist because of myself. No one made God. God is eternal. And that is evident within this name that is used. Where we saw 34 times in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way down to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, the name Elohim, or God, we see the name Lord God some 19 times, beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and going all the way down to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. The name Lord God is used of a very personal relationship, a personal relationship between God and man. Yahweh highlights God's relational nature, if you would, while Elohim calls attention to His immense majesty and His universal sovereignty, as Michael Whitworth would tell us in his great little book on the epic of God. God formed man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He walked with man and he made woman and he communicated with man directly. All of these things are very, very personal, very relational. God wants to interact with us, men, his creation, and we ought to want to interact with him. Oh, this study is so rich. We have briefly seen today that God is Elohim, the powerful God, the only God, as Jesus said. We have seen that He created from nothing, something no man could ever do or will ever do. We have further observed that some 32 times the name God is found in these opening verses, that it changes in chapter 2 to Lord God because God has a relationship with man. Come back next time for another study where we'll advance our understanding of the creation. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright